Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all-mailbag show here at AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions. My name is John Campy. I am the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News, and I'm so glad you're here today. And I'm going to let you guys know, the, the basis and the premise of the show is that we like to take your questions because movie conversations are best when they're two ways, right? So what you can do is you can email us your questions anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Now, every day, Monday through Friday on AMC Movie Talk, we take a couple of questions from the mailbag, but on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays, we do nothing but take mailbag questions. And uh, that's what we're going to do today. Now, before we get into it, I'm reminding you guys once again, this is really exciting. I'm really thrilled about it. Uh, Comic-Con is coming up. And we're doing a number of things as AMC Movie News at Comic-Con. And a couple of the big ones are, number one, we're going to be doing our AMC Movie Talk meet and greet. And that's going to be at the Omni Hotel on Friday night, I think around 6 o'clock, uh, right across the street from the convention center. So make sure you come on over and say hi to us there. But also, of course, is our annual Masters of the Web panel. And this year's panel is I'm so excited about it. It's all, it's going to be all focused on comic book movies this year, appropriately so. You know, last year we had a horror theme. This year it's going to be a comic book movie theme. And it's going to be populated instead of the traditional Masters of the Web, we're going with YouTube. Um, film pundits. So a couple of special things, comic book movies and YouTube pundits, and I'm super excited about it. And one of the things I'm most excited about is, of course, our special guest uh, this year. Since we're talking about comic book movies, this dude, Manu Bennett, has played the best comic book villain on TV for the last number of years, of course, playing Deathstroke on TV's Arrow. He was also amazing in Spartacus, playing Crixus, one of the main characters there. And, of course, he's Azog, the white orc in uh, the new Hobbit movies. And he's just a phenomenal talent. I'm so excited that he's going to be our special guest on the panel. And, of course, joining us on the panel... From ANC Movie Talk, of course, you got myself, you got John Schnepp, you got Christian Harloff, and also joining us, you have Harloff Schmo's No Partner. Mark Ellis is going to be there with us. We've got from Fandango and DC All Access, Miss Tiffany Smith, who has, of course, been on uh, our guest a few times on ANC Movie Talk, and the one of the only Mr. Jeremy Johns um, from YouTube, who's who has been on AMC Movie Talk before. Um, and this is going to be a lot of fun, of course, with special guest Manu Bennett. That panel is going to be on the Thursday of Comic-Con at 11.30 a.m. in room 24 ABC. Uh, so they put all three of those rooms together for our panel. I'm going to be putting some stuff up on my Facebook page and on Twitter where you guys can you know, find all the details and super excited about it. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's get into the movie questions today from the mailbag, starting with question number one. And the first question today comes to us from Izzy Sanchez, who writes... Hello, sons of AMC. I love your show and I watch it all the time. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Izzy. I was super excited the other day when you announced that Pacific Rim 2 is on the way. I love everything Guillermo del Toro has done. With, um, has done. with that said, I am surprised that you have not mentioned his animated movie coming out soon called Book of Life. I saw the trailer uh, to this a few days ago and it blew me away. The story looks good. With as much love as is given to him on your show, I guess that is why I'm shocked You, uh, this film has gone under the radar. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Izzy. Really appreciate it. Um, and the, the film he's talking about is called Book of Life, and the trailer came out the other day, and you can find it on YouTube. Just look up Book of Life trailer. Um, and it's an int it looks like a Tim Burton film, to be honest. It, the Visually and stylistically and even theme-wise, it, it feels like a Tim Burton animated film. And it's in that same style. Um there are a couple things to bring up here. First things first, the trailer itself. I wasn't blown away by the trailer, to be honest. I think it looks like it's got some elements there that that really suggest that the film could be something really good. But overall, as a package, for a trailer, remember, we're just talking about the trailer. The trailer didn't get me all that excited, to be honest with you. And I don't know if it's because we've seen this visual style before many times with this type of a theme and this type of a movie. Uh, I mean, really reminded me a lot of The Corpse Bride in many ways. But uh, it's not a bad trailer. Um, it didn't turn me off. I I'm just saying it didn't, as a first trailer, didn't really get me all that excited about it. But that doesn't mean anything. It's just a trailer. We'll see how the film turns out. But the, the bigger issue that this brings up, um, Izzy, is this. This is not Guillermo del Toro. This is not his movie. This is Guillermo del Toro is not the director of uh, Book of Life. He is a producer on it. 
And as a producer on it, that means he may have just signed a couple of checks. It means he could have been, you know, in the studio with them, putting the movie together two or three days out of the entire time they've done it. It could just mean he's lending his name to it. It could mean that, hey, he really liked this story, and so he wanted to pull together a team to go and make it, but he's not really involved in making it himself. Or it could mean he's really involved, but most of the time when you see somebody, especially a big name, like a Steven Spielberg or a J.J. Abrams or a Christopher Nolan or a Guillermo del Toro, quite often when you see their name on as a producer, that means they probably had a little bit of involvement up front, whatever, but it it doesn't mean they were, you know, that what you're going to see on the screen with that movie is really a reflection of them as a filmmaker. I mean, look, and we see this all the time in film, right? Where people mistake because the studios put a big name on the poster, it kind of tricks us into thinking that this is their movie, right? I mean, I lost count of how many movies Steven Spielberg has produced or let his name be attached to. But but 90% of those films, he really had next to nothing to do with them. Um, it's got some big examples of this, as a matter of fact. Uh, one is J.J. Abrams with uh, Cloverfield. There are still so many people today that think J.J. Abrams directed Cloverfield. He didn't. That's not his movie. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it's the guy uh, right now. I think it's Reeves. Let me just put, double check this here. Um Let's see, let me in. I believe the uh, the guy who directed that was actually Matt Reeves. And Matt, so Matt Reeves directed um, Cloverfield and then he went on to direct Let Me In. He did a really good job, uh, job of that on Let Me In. And now he's directing the new Dawn of the Planet of the Apes movie, which is coming out, which is getting ridiculously big word of mouth. But still a lot of people think and this is what the studio wanted you to think by putting JJ's name on that poster that he's the guy behind this film. And really, it was Matt Reeves. Uh, JJ was a producer. Another big one like that is right now, everybody seems to think Michael Bay is directing the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie. And he's not. He's not the director of that film. The director of that film, of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film, is actually the dude who directed like uh, Battle Los Angeles. It's not Michael Bay. But he's a big, recognizable, bombastic kind of name. So they put that up there so people will will associate in their heads. And that's the case with Book of Life. Guillermo del Toro is not the director of this film. And, I, you know, I want to always encourage, like, film fans to look a little more carefully with a film by Christopher Nolan. Because remember, Christopher Nolan was the producer, one of the producers at any rate, of Man of Steel. And he's he's the guy who kind of got the ball rolling. Like he got the pitch and heard the idea um, for the movie, and then went to Warner Brothers and said, "Yeah, I should turn this idea into a movie. This is this is really good." But that was pretty much the extent of his involvement. I'm sure he had some input here and there and all that kind of stuff. But Christopher Nolan's attached. But when you saw the trailer from the director of The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises, do do do, to instantly kind of create this association in our heads as film audience with that filmmaker is in charge of this movie when it's really not the case. So I think we as filmmakers, or we as filmmakers, I think we as film fans need to do a better job of being a little bit more aware of who is actually behind a certain movie. So look, getting back to Book of Life, Book of Life may end up being a fantastic movie. There are certain elements in that story uh, synopsis that we got in the trailer that suggest that, hey, this could be quite good, uh, but we don't know. But either way, it's not a Guillermo del Toro film. So just try to keep that in mind. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Jamal Pullum, who writes, Hi, AMC Movie Talk crew. My question is, what is your favorite Tony uh, Scott film? Good question, Jamal. Um, of course, Tony Scott, the, uh, the the slightly less, slightly lesser known uh, Scott brother with his brother Ridley. Um my favorite Tony Scott film. Well, let's put it this way. There, I think overall, when you look at his entire body of work, I'm not a huge Tony Scott fan, but he has made some films that I'm really, really big on. Now, but for every good movie he's done, he's also done like a Pelham 123. I think that was called. Yeah, Pelham 123, The Taking of Pelham 123. Um, I wasn't big on Man on Fire, the Denzel Washington film he did. 
Uh, I know a lot of people really do quite like Man on Fire. I wasn't really big. I didn't really like Spy Game. Um, I didn't like Domino. Um, I didn't like The Fan. Crimson Tide was pretty good. I know uh, a lot of people will overlook Crimson Tide when they talk. Beverly Hills Cop 2 was good. Days of Thunder was good. The Last Boy Scout, I think, is probably Tony Scott's most underrated film so far as The Last Boy Scout. Um, But my two favorites of his... Uh, my number two favorite of his was, I believe, the last film. He, yeah, it was the last film he directed uh, with um, Denzel Washington. It was called Unstoppable. And I, I think it's Chris Pine who's in that with him, with Denzel. And it's that movie that about the train. You know, it's kind of speed, but on train. Um, and I found that I was shocked by how much I liked Unstoppable. Really, it's like okay, it's a, it's just it's all it takes place just on a train that's just moving. Yeah, I couldn't believe how much. I was on the edge of my seat. Like how much of that movie I was on the edge of my seat when in theory, it sounds like it could be really quite boring. Um, but I was really pleasantly surprised by, um, by Unstoppable. I, I think overall, it's a pretty underappreciated film. I think it's a really, really solid movie. Uh, and, you know, if that's, if, if you know, under the tragedy of the, the passing of, of Tony Scott, if he's going to have a last film, that was a good film to have as his last film. But obviously my favorite Tony Scott film is Top Gun. I know that sounds cliche-ish, but it's a cliche for a reason. It, it's, it's, it's his best movie. It's the most iconic. It's the most memorable. It is the one film of his that really took root in the pulp culture. Um, so, I mean, if you today, I mean, it's a, it's a super old movie now. I mean, it's a 1986 movie, so it's coming up on its. Oh, God, it's coming up on its 30 year anniversary in a year or two. Holy crap, it's that old. Anyway. Um, Top Gun. Uh, so yeah, it, it's uh, that would be my favorite Tony Scott movie. But I'd be curious. Uh, let let me know what you guys think. Jump into the comments section and let me know what you think is the best, or or what to you is the best Tony Scott film that he had uh, in his career. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Paul Hansen. And Paul Hansen writes. Dear AMC crew, I've been watching you for about a year now and have been very impressed with your honesty and opinions. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, Today, July the 4th, so I guess he wrote this email the other day, is my 39th birthday. Well, happy belated birthday to you, Paul. Uh, There will be no presents, cake, or parties for me, only a few happy birthdays on Facebook and the possibility to take my 15-year-old son to the movies. We saw Days of Future Past and Winter Soldier for his birthday earlier this year. So what movie currently playing would we both most likely enjoy? Thanks and bring on the filthy. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Paul. Um, Well, hey, awesome birthday out. Going to get to go see Days of Future Past and Captain America Winter Soldier. I don't know that there's ever been a time when two better comic book movies have been in theater at the same time. Uh, Captain America Winter Soldier and Days of Future Past. You've all heard me blather on and on about how just incredibly awesome both those films are. Um, But as far as what's playing right now, well, I I believe in some theaters, Days of Future Past, and even in a couple of theaters, Winter Soldier is still playing, but obviously you've seen those already. I wouldn't wreck it for a 15-year-old. It depends on what kind of parent you are, I suppose, what what style of parent you are. Um, I I don't know that I would take a 15-year-old to see um, 22 Jump Street just yet. Uh, but I mean, there's no right or wrong answer. It's whatever style you, you as a parent, you decide is, is good for your kid. That's, to, that's an individual choice. Um, so with that being said, honestly, to me, a good timeout that I think both, you know, you as the older party and your son as the younger party would probably most likely enjoy. I'm going to go with How to Train Your Dragon 2. I'm super impressed with How to Train Your Dragon 2. And, you know, I really like the first How to Train Your Dragon. But the trailers for How to Train Your... The marketing campaign for How to Train Your Dragon 2, while it wasn't a bad marketing campaign, it it didn't give me the impression that it was going to be as good as it really is. And trust me, How to Train Your Dragon 2 is a lot of fun. Uh, it's not for kids, but it is kid friendly. It's a lot like the Pixar films. It's not for kids, but it is definitely kid friendly. So I believe kids, teenagers, adults, seniors, I believe there's stuff in this movie for everybody. And so if you're looking for a film that you and your 15 year old son can go and see this weekend, 
seriously, uh, you know, taking out of the equation the films you've seen already, and for my own personal preferences, I'd take 22 Jump Street out of that equation. I'm going to leave it with How to Train Your Dragon 2. I think you'll both really like it uh, because it's for everybody, and it's high quality, great, it's it's exciting, it's funny, it's it's more emotionally deep than you'd think it would be. Um, really, really good film. I'm I'm still not sure if it surpasses the first How to Train Your Dragon for me. It might, though. It's really close. So uh, thanks a lot for the question, man. And yeah, how, go see How to Train Your Dragon 2. And then drop us a note and let us know what you thought about it. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Pavel Rizhov, who writes, Thanks for your amazing work. Well, thank you, Pavel. Uh, my question is why people ask you to bring on the filthy. Well, yeah, the last question asked me to bring on the filthy. And uh, a movie-related question is whether we will see Spider-Man in a Sinister Six movie, and if yes, to what extent? Well, of course, let's get to the first question, Pavel. I, I have to answer this every few months, and that's fair. That's cool. Because a lot of the email questions and a lot of the people on Facebook and a lot of people on Twitter keep saying, bring on the filthy. So where did that come from? For those of you who are new or relatively new to the AMC Movie Talk world, um, bring on the filthy came as a result of a mailbag episode I did... I don't know, five, six months ago. I honestly can't even remember how long ago it was. But the topic was the new movie coming up, Fifty Shades of Grey. And I can't remember exactly how it all came about, but basically here's the gist. I said, you know, I don't know how they're going to make this movie. There's no way you can make this movie PG-13 because it's just, because it's filthy. Um, and then I said, now don't get me wrong. I've got no problem with filthy bring on the filthy. I kind of just said that off the top of my head. And br ever since bring on the filthy has kind of stuck <laughs> and it's almost become like my unofficial motto. I never say it anymore, but everybody else says it now. So uh, that's where bring on the filthy came from. Now to your actual question, we know that Sony is developing a Venom and a Sinister Six movie. They're also developing Amazing Spider-Man 3 and 4. So you raise a great question. Okay, we've got Spider-Man 3 and we've got Spider-Man 4, but we're getting this movie called Sinister Six. Is Spider-Man going to be in this Sinister Six movie? It's a great question. I honestly don't know. To me, if you're going to have Spider-Man in Sinister Six, then why wouldn't you just make Spider-Man hyphen Sinister Six? You know, like you have Star Wars, Return of the Jedi. Uh, the way you have, you know, X-Men, Days of Future Past. Why wouldn't you just call it Spider-Man Sinister Six? So the title kind of leads me to believe that maybe Spider-Man won't be in it at all. Or maybe if he is in it, it'll just be a small cameo. Like the, the, the impetus that brings the Sinister Six together. But then they, they have their own thing going on and Spider-Man's not really in it. But it's possible. Spider-Man is the most popular character that Sony has. So... You know, one certain train of thought would suggest that since Spider-Man is your most popular character, you'd want to put him in all those films to, att to attract the attention. Much like what Fox does with Wolverine. I mean, Wolverine is front and center in all of the Fox, you know, superhero movies other than X-Men First Class. At least that's the way it feels. Um, and sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes like Days of Future Past, it really works. So I honestly, I don't know. I would think that he's not going to be in it much, if at all. But at the other hand, it seems like the business thing to do to put him in a lot of it. So I don't know. I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm just wild guess here. Don't hold me to this. Wild guess. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that Spider-Man will either not be in Sinister Six or will be in it very little. So he may be the spark at the beginning of the film that kind of is the, the rallying point for the Sinister Six. I don't know. But I'm going to guess from zero to a very little, Spider-Man will be in Sinister Six or right at the very end or something like that, but that he won't be a significant presence. That's my guess. But, I mean, who knows? I mean, there's a lot of different ways that could go with this, but that's the way I'm going to guess for now. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Andrew Evans. And Andrew Evans writes, Hello, AMC. My question is, what is your favorite movie scene of all time? Ah, well, here's, it depends on how you define scene. 
Because when you talk to a lot of people, they'll say a scene is that one 20 second clip. They'll, some people will say a scene is everything that happens in that room, even though the movie jumps around a little bit and then keeps coming back to the room, they still consider that altogether one scene. So for the purposes of this question, I'm going to cheat a little bit. But my favorite scene probably of all time is the, the Luke and Vader confrontation in the Emperor's throne room in Return of the Jedi. And because there's so much tension and drama and excitement, and it really is the trilogy coming to a head. Right close second to that would be the scene that is happening at the exact same time as that, which is the space battle uh, as the rebel force is attacking the second Death Star in Return of the Jedi. And these two things are going on at the same time. Now, I consider that space battle still the single best space battle we've ever had in film. And we're talking about a movie from the 1980s. But I still consider that space battle at the end of Return of the Jedi is still the best space battle we've ever had. So there's that and the thing. And then they're kind of woven together. So I'm going to kind of cheat and say that mixture of the two, because it's all happening simultaneously and it jumps back and forth pretty quick of this space battle is going on. Well, this confrontation between Luke Vader and the Emperor is going on against the background, literally out the window, the background of this great space battle that's happening. So I'd say collectively, that is my favorite scene all time in movies. So I'm, I'm cheating a little bit, but that's my all time favorite scene. Um, I'd have to put a lot of thought into it to come up with a list. And, and thankfully, you didn't ask me for a list. I think... Well, there's a lot of different kinds of stuff. I'd like to know what you guys think. J jump in the comment section of this video and make sure you leave uh, some lists. Leave a list or two about some of your all-time favorite uh, scenes from movies. Doesn't even have to be... That's the great thing about a great scene is it doesn't even have to be from a great movie. You can have a bad movie, but man, it had this one scene that was awesome. You know, there are, there are movies like that. So jump in the comment section and let us know what your favorite scenes are. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Nicholas Diaz. And Nicholas writes, Hey, sons and daughters of AMC, I adore your show. My day would not be complete without you fine folks. Thanks so much, Nicholas. Um, seeing the recent trend of top five questions, I would like to know what are your top five spoof movies? Um, top five spoof movies. Okay, um, for me... I mean, there are a bunch. Man, this is a tough one. Okay, let's put it this way. All modern spoof movies suck. I have not seen a good original spoof movie. Well, by definition, spoof movies aren't original, but you know what I'm saying. I have not seen a good spoof movie in ages, whether it's the Scary Movie franchise, um, you know, Meet the Spartans, um, you know, Vampires Suck. Um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of them and they're all terrible. They just don't make good spoof movies anymore. And so if I'm going to go back to my favorites, okay, I'm telling you, it's close for my number one spot because it's either Spaceballs or the original airplane. Dear heavens, folks, if you have not seen Spaceballs and if you have not seen the original airplane, please go and watch them. And then when you do watch them, you will understand how much today's spoof movies suck. Like, suck. They're so bad. And, you know, so, but don't think that all spoof movies have always sucked. Airplane and Spaceballs, man. Go watch those. Also, Top Secret with Val Kilmer. Awesome. Latrine! I, I love Top Secret. Um, so if you get a chance, make sure you watch Top Secret. Hot Shots Part 2 with Charlie Sheen. Awesome. Hot Shots Part 2. So what have I mentioned so far? I've mentioned Spaceballs and Airplane. I'm not sure which is one and which is two. Uh, we've got Top Secret, Hot Shots Part 2, uh, and maybe Naked Gun. Either Naked Gun or the original Hot Shots. Um, those both work for me. And, and then if you're talking Naked Gun, well, maybe Naked Gun 2. Uh, so, because both of those were really great. Naked Gun Part 1 has a really special place in my heart. So, uh, for now, don't hold hold me to this, but for now, I'm going to say in the one and two spots, in no particular order, is Spaceballs and the original Airplane. Then I'm going to go to Top Secret, Hot Shots Part 2, and, oh, am I going to put a Naked Gun in there or the first Hot Shots? I'm going to put Naked Gun Part 1. 
uh, in there. So those would be my five favorite spoof movies. But once again, guys, jump down into the comments section and uh, let me know what are some of your favorite spoof movies. Or maybe there's even, let me know if there's a modern spoof movie that you actually thought was okay. Um, because I can't think of any off the top of my head. To me, they're all just a big pile, steaming, flowing ocean of crap. But if you can think of one that you actually think is kind of worthwhile, let us know in the comment section. I'd like to check it out. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Julian Catan, who writes, is that like Settlers of Catan? Anyway, hey, AMC crew, I love the show. I've been watching ever since the announcement of Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor and haven't missed an episode since. Well, thanks so much, Julian. Appreciate that. Uh, keep up the great work. My question concerns the next Terminator movie. Do you think that with its time travel me mechanics, do you think that with its time travel mechanics, it will compare to movies like X-Men Days of Future Past or Star Trek 2009? Is this idea of rebooting through time travel a trend in Hollywood? Could we give it an official name? Excellent question, Julian. Excellent question. Because yeah, I mean, Star Trek in 2009... It, it wasn't, it's not a reboot because in theory, it happens in the same universe as the classic Star Trek, right? But they still wanted a reboot without calling it a reboot. So they use this time travel dynamic to say history has now been altered. This is what the reality is now. So they sort of rebooted. But it's not a reboot. That's the thing. But they sort of restarted by changing history. X-Men Days of Future Past has done that same thing. They just wiped out a lot of their um, plot inconsistencies and a lot of their plot holes by doing this same thing. They've done a time travel reset. That's really what it is. It's a reset. It's not a reboot. It's a reset. So that's what Star Trek in 2009 did. It reset the Star Wars history because they're saying history's now been changed. This is what it is now. Uh, X-Men Days of Future Past has now left us with a new history because of the events in Days of Future Past. They've reset it. And it looks like Terminator is going to be doing the same thing. It looks like they're going to be using time travel mechanics to reset the Terminator canon, if you will. Reset the Terminator history to give us a new set of films that can still be completely original. And yet, theoretically speaking, they still live within the same reality that's just been altered because of history. Um, I'm, I'm going to make up a new name, time setting. It's a time set there. When, when a movie franchises franchise decides they want to reset everything without actually rebooting, we'll call that a time set or a time setting, uh, or just reset resets, probably the best word, but when it's using time travel, I'll call it a time set. There we go. New name. And is it becoming a trend? Well, it's be the thing is, it can only be a trend in existing franchises, right? So Star Wars could theoretically, they won't do this, but Star Wars being a long established franchise, if they want to change things up, they could do a time set. They could say Luke or the emperor goes back in time and, uh, or a clone of the reincarnated emperor goes back in time and changes history. Now you've got a time set. You can retell the story of Star Wars in a different way now. Um, what other franchises could you do it with? You could do it with Avengers in theory, but you can't do it with original films. So, although you can use, definitely use time travel mechanics. So those are three really good examples actually that you brought up of time setting and will it be, continue to be a trend? Yes. I believe we will see it again because it allows the studios and the filmmakers to still say this is that classic universe while kind of rebooting it in a way. So it's a really clever device and it is probably when now we're going to see it three times in the span of about four or five years, we will probably see it again at some point with other long established um, science fiction-y um, uh, franchises. It'd have to be science fiction because you can't do it for you know a Clint Eastwood movie. But anyway, all right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Hunter Smith. And Hunter Smith writes... Greetings. Since this Batman Superman movie is building up hype, do you think a James Bond slash Jason Bourne crossover could come out in the future? Thanks and keep up the good work. Well, thanks a lot for the question, Hunter. And this question's kind of come up before this theory that could we see, I mean, crossover seem to be all the big thing right now in the comic book genre, but could that expand beyond? We've seen horror crossovers with Freddy and Jason, right? So could we see a super spy crossover with James Bond 
and Jason Bourne. I'm going to say no for a couple of reasons. One, different studio, so that creates a problem. But beyond that, they're two really different types. Jason Bourne movies are always about him and survival. It's not about him saving the world. And it's, about, it's very Jason Bourne-centric, whereas James Bond films are about him trying to save the queen, save the country, save the world, whatever. Stop a nuclear attack, whatever. So they're, they're two different plot characters, if you will. They do, they do different types of stories. Now, I suppose you could come up with some kind of a, of a plot mechanism where um, the U.S. government, something bad has happened and the U.S. government is set up or somebody set up that Jason Bourne is the bad guy and Bond has to hunt Bourne and then he hunts him. But then when they meet, he realizes the Bourne's not the bad guy and they start to work together. You could come up with a story plot like that. But I still don't think it'll happen because as much as I like a couple of the Bourne movies, Jason Bourne is not in James Bond's league. He's just not. James Bond has been around for a thousand years. He is the super spy. He is the man. Uh, Jason Bourne, cute. He had three movies. Very cute. Don't get me wrong. I like the Bourne movies. I do. I like the Bourne movies. Don't get me wrong. I like them. But, But let's just call it what it is. Jason Bourne is not fit to carry James Bond's shoes. All right. He's in a different league. He's a different stature. He's got a different status. He is the man. Uh, And I love Jason Bourne, but talk to me again about this type of a question. Once Jason Bourne has had five more films, when there have been five more Jason Bourne movies and they've all been fairly good, then let's talk about crossing over James Bond with Jason Bourne. Because as of right now, it's just, it's, it's almost like this. It's like saying, let's have, I don't know, Superman have a crossover movie with Kick-Ass. It, I mean, Kick. look, I love the first Kick-Ass. I even like the second Kick-Ass. Big, big step down from the first Kick-Ass, but I'm one of those people who did like the second Kick-Ass. But Kick-Ass, as a character, forget the superpowers, as a character, as an icon, as a symbol of the genre itself... Kick-Ass is not fit to carry Superman's discarded red underwear. He's just not. So it doesn't make sense as a crossover. And that's why, for now, I'm going to say, just my personal opinion. Like, you may have a totally different opinion on this. You may think Jason Bourne is totally worthy of being in a film with James Bond. Awesome. Express that in the comments section. I'm just saying, for me personally, it doesn't work in my own head because they're so unequal to me right now. Like, one is a total generation after generation after generation icon and one is a fairly new upstart that had three films and isn't even really around right now so for those reasons different studios they're two totally different types of stories and different types of characters and three they're just on different levels so for that reason but it's a great question but for that reason i would say no i don't think we're going to see one Uh, but you never know If, if studio thinks it can make money stranger things have happened keep that in mind all right let's see uh luke bryant writes hi amc love the show thank you so much luke really appreciate that um my question is do you think the casting of ben affleck as batman will backfire in the future when they want him to keep playing batman considering he's already 41 years old he's only going to get older that's true that is a scientific fact he is only going to get older and he might become too old for the role would love to hear your thoughts well thanks a lot for the question luke and you do raise an interesting um, point. You do raise an interesting point. Now, I am I'm still on the boat that casting Ben Affleck was a stroke of genius. I think it was a great move. And I'm telling you, I have a couple of friends who have some really rational reasons as to why they don't like uh, Ben Affleck as Batman, and that's cool. But what's frustrating to me a lot, and I don't want to go into this too much, but I'm just going to touch on it because I've talked about this a lot, is I, I still get frustrated by some people when I hear Oh, they're just on the bandwagon. Oh, casting Ben Affleck was stupid. And you ask him, you, pu- you push him on, you say, w- uh, why? Well, he did Geely. Okay, yeah, t- t- 10 years ago. He did Daredevil. Yeah, o- over 10, 10 years ago. And then they'll say, man, any movie, you put him in a movie, he'll ruin it. You put Ben Affleck in a movie, he'll ruin it. Really? Really? Be- because the last time I checked... The last movie that Ben Affleck was the lead actor in, you know, the movie that he had to carry, 
won Best Picture at the Oscars. So, so tell me again how putting Ben Affleck in the lead will ruin a movie. Before that, the last film that he was the lead in, that he had to carry, was The Town, that was pretty much universally loved. Um, I mean, so, so tell me again about how putting Ben Affleck as the lead in a movie is going to ruin a movie because that makes no sense. Now I've just got, I've got some other friends of mine that have some very rational reasons why they don't like it. They say, you know, for him, for them, Ben Affleck has just become too much of this status in and of himself that they're afraid that when they watch Batman, all they're going to be able to see is Ben Affleck. I get that argument. I don't think that's going to happen, but I understand the argument and I understand where they're coming from. Um, some people are concerned that, uh, well, there's some other concerns that, that are legit, but these ones about, oh, he did this bad movie and this bad movie and this bad movie. Yeah, that was over 10 years ago. Oh, he, he's going to ruin a movie. The movies he leads are critically acclaimed and winning Oscars. So all that kind of stuff. But you raise a very interesting question, Luke, when you ask, is Warner Brothers, though, backfiring on themselves? Are they going to shoot themselves in the foot by bringing a 41-year-old, Bruce Wayne to start as Batman. Now, let's, of course, get some background. Remember, uh, Warner Brothers had already decided that they wanted this new Batman to be not a brand new Batman. They didn't want to cover an origin story again. They wanted more of a Dark Knight Batman. They wanted a Batman who is a veteran, who has been doing this a long time, whose name is already feared who has been through the wars and has been through the battles. Maybe he's a lot more jaded than a fresh Batman would be. Maybe he's a lot more weary than a, than a old Batman would be. This really is more in line with the classic Dark Knight Returns comics, that, that type of Batman. I believe that's the direction they're going. So in that case, that's, that's a bad... And actually, I prefer that Batman over a young Batman. But if that's the case, and you're going to go for this seasoned, war-weary veteran Batman then it makes sense you got to get a guy who's 40 plus. Has to be in terrific shape. And have you seen the pictures of Ben Affleck lately? Um, so that made sense. But the concern you raise is valid. Okay, does this limit what they can do with him moving forward? And I'm going to say no. Now, remember, it's very, very rare that we get the same guy playing a character for 15 plus years, like Hugh Jackman has done, right? Um because, you know, let me look this up. I don't know how old Hugh Jackman is off the top of my head. So I'm going to just pull this up quick. Hugh Jackman. So, oops, Hugh Jackman. Uh, he was actually born in 1968. So he, Hugh Jackman's only like... 46 right now, but Hugh Jackman looks like he could go for another four five, six or seven years. I mean, he's in better shape right now at 46 than he has ever been in his entire life. Ben Affleck right now is in better shape at 41 or 42 than he has ever been in his entire life. And I'm going to go on, 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 on a limb and say that. I mean, look at Mel Gibson. Have you seen the pictures of Mel Gibson? Look, I'm going to cheat again a little bit here. Let me pull this up. Mel Gibson muscles. Jim. Okay, well, let me just see if I, there's the, okay, let me pull up this picture here so you can get a look at this dude. I mean, this is sick. This is Mel Gibson um, going into the gym and I can't remember how old Mel Gibson is. I'm, let me pull up his age too. Okay, take a look at this picture. This is Mel Gibson. This is Mel Gibson. All right. He's 58. 59? He's pushing 60. Tell me that dude, forget the person Mel Gibson, just look at that physical dude right there. Just look at that dude. Tell me that dude couldn't still be Batman, an older, war-weary, veteran Batman. Look at that dude at 58 years old, maybe 59 years old. So Ben Affleck, when you're looking at him right now at 41, Let's say 55, okay? I think he could legitimately, keeping with the type of physicality that he has, if he keeps himself in shape, and he's a young, let's face it, he's a young looking 41, 42 year old. Um, I believe it's safe to say that theoretically, and if all things go well and his health stays good, Ben Affleck could play Batman for another 14 years. And, and who could we ask to play a character longer than that? 
So really, because they've established that this Batman is the older War Riri veteran, the guy who's been through the battles already, I think starting him off at 40, now I think starting him off at 50 would have been a push, but starting him off at 41, 42, that's still young, man. I totally see it. I totally believe that he could play Batman for at least another 10 years, probably another 15 years. You start to push it when you go past that. But I think they're safe. I really do. Especially when you look at guys like Mel Gibson, Sylvester Stallone. You see what these dudes, Bruce Willis, you see what type of physicality and shape these guys are able to keep themselves in. And Ben Affleck is a physical beast, man. He's a big, tall, strong dude. And I think he can do this. Um, and, and I think we're safe to have him as Batman for a lot of years to come. All right, folks. Well, that'll do it for me. I ran all of questions. Thank you so much today for joining me here on AMC Mailbag. We really appreciate you joining us. Once again, don't forget Comic-Con is coming up. Keep your eyes open for that. And listen, lots of great movies playing in AMC theaters everywhere. Run on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and of course, your movie ticket information. If you want an audio-only version of this episode or any of our podcasts, look in the description of this video and you'll see a link to our podcast feed so you can listen to us on the way to work. And uh, of course, you can follow me on the various social media networks on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Always at John Campia. That's where you can find me. So thanks a lot for joining me today, guys. My name is John Campia for AMC Movie News. And until tomorrow, bye-bye.